Hey gang. So um, last night I decided to render out uh, kind of my first real test with 5.6, uh, obviously Unreal Engine 5.6, um, which uh, came out into full release this week. A little surprised that uh, the preview, we only got one preview build, but um, I was kind of expecting several. But uh, since they fixed the main issue I had with 5.5, .5, which was the uh, uh, issue that it had with uh, rendering refractions within the path tracer, where you'd basically get a doubling of the image on anything that was translucent because you'd have um, the render without any refractions built in, and then you'd have like a ghosted, you know, layer on top of that with the distorted uh refracted uh translucent material which basically means that for the entire 5.5 .5 cycle uh this was uh not something i could really work on i finally got him around to you know uh, basically i just set my opacity on the glass to zero which you know fixed it you know to the point where i could still have refractions but um i would lo i lost effectively having any kind of tinting on the glass or in this case, dirt on the glass, stuff like that. The only other solution would have been to have another layer of geometry um, that had like dirt textures and stuff on it sitting on top. And that would probably work. Um, I'm not sure how well that would work or, you know, whatever, but, you know, it's not an ideal solution. Uh, but having it all baked into a single material just is easier to work with. And so, um, the other principle, the principal goal here was just to see how low I could make samples, um, so that I could finally test out the um, uh, temporal denoiser uh, for the path tracer. And this is going to be the weakest part of the entire shot. It's going to be right here, and part of that is because we have this reflection of uh, the pilot, you know, getting lit by the green uh, surfaces inside the cockpit. And that makes it so that, um, you know, you just lose contrast here. And when you do that, you know, generally speaking, you're not going to get a ton of uh, uh, additional sampling here where you don't have uh, a lot of contrast. But aside from that, this is still pretty stable. Um, and so what I would expect from further uh, reducing the samples... Um, or even just optimizing the samples a bit, um, is that you just you, you would just get you know some softness that you wouldn't otherwise have. So the more samples, the more the details can resolve themselves, especially in some of these weaker areas uh, where you just have lower contrast. Um, the other downside, of course, is when you're lowering both spatial and temporal samples. Um, you know, you're going to start losing some, you know, other kinds of details. So if you, you know, lower the temporal samples, which handle uh, how motion blur looks. And if I frame here, you can see, you know, we're getting a dot, 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 dot effect. Now, once in motion, you, you really don't see that. Um, but when um, rendering to final, I would want to use more samples than we have here. Uh, especially temporal samples. Uh, and just keep in mind that the um, temporal samples are basically a multiplier of your spatial samples because you're essentially, for every one temporal sample, you're still getting all your spatial samples. Um, and so, like, you could probably tweak it so that if you increased your temporal samples, you could reduce your spatial samples. Um, when you're just rendering in the, um, uh, the raster renderer within Unreal, they say that... Um, you, you know, if you want motion blur, only put in temporal samples. And maybe that's true for the path tracer as well. So uh, that may be a way of getting a best, best of both worlds effect. So if I set uh, sp spatial to one and then just only use temporal samples, I could probably get this result, but with better motion blur. Um, but that will be, you know, an experiment I run down, down the road and we'll see how that looks. So if I put in like, you know, 512 temporal samples and re-render it uh, and, and see what that render time looks like. Uh, this was rendered, I think it was like five, 
seven two or something like that because I was doing twenty four by twenty four. Um, but um, I'm definitely going to have to uh, rerun this and do some different tests to see if I can uh, resolve because if you know I'm doing a bunch of temporal samples here. Um, I might not get a sharper result, but it may be slightly more stable because there's a little bit of what I'd call like AI softness going on here where it's just a little bit crinkly over time. And a lot of that just comes down to frame to frame. It's just resolving slightly differently because it's such a low contrast area because of the reflection. But if I jump over to the color corrected um, tab here in After Effects, like you're just not gonna see that. And so for like the vast majority of shots, you know, obviously because, you know, everything's a little bit more crunchy and contrasty, you know, this is a little bit more apparent. And so that that's why I'm like, well, if I just uh go in and reduce the spatial samples and increase the temporal samples, like what can I get, you know, for essentially the same cost? Um, and so that's interesting. Um, it might make this stuff look a little bit better too, but, um, that, you know, that's really interesting. Uh, the next step for this, uh, shot is to, uh, so right now the camera shake is non-deterministic. It's using the, you know, the game side, uh, camera shake system, which, you know, I got a result I'm really happy with. The problem is every time I run it, it looks a little bit different because the camera's not exactly in the same place. So, you know, essentially I'm going to just duplicate that um, sequencer file so that I can pull out the current camera shake and replace it with a new one and just see what I can do to get a better, you know, because I'm using multiple camera shakes combined for like micro and macro kind of shakes and that kind of stuff. And so uh, it just feels so much more real <laughs> when you do stuff like that. And so, uh, you know, if I can get a look that I'm, I'm happy with, um, that will allow me to then start being able to do multi-pass rendering. So like most of the weapon effects and all the explosion effects in this shot are non-deterministic because I have spawners that shoot projectiles. They're off, uh, uh, basically out of frame. Uh, throughout the whole thing. Uh, however, these purple shots that whip past uh, the Viper when it's close, those are hand keyed. Um, and so, um, you know, I'll be able to maintain that stuff and make that look good. But um, all this other stuff here that doesn't always look good every time I render it, um, uh, I'll be able to get something, you know, basically be able to render that stuff each time, you know, uh, time and time again until I get what I want, but I also can do it. So like, I just have explosions happening around this guy up here. Uh, and I'm able to just, you know, to rerun it until I have something I like. Uh, and then same with, you know, uh, essentially there's, um, um, uh, an orange weapon spawner that are, that's off screen left here, uh, out ahead of these guys. And so like, I can tweak that so that all this, or, you know, orangey yellow weapons fire that is whipping by looks good. And of course, uh, every time one of these uh, uh, projectiles um, essentially runs out of time because there's a timer on it, they explode into uh, smaller, sparkier shaped versions of that. Um, and so that's, you know, that's one of those things that's going to look different every time because the, the time on them is not... Uh, uniform. There's a randomization amount to all that stuff. So I can run that again and, you know, and again and again until I get something I want. Um, I also could do something like uh, do a capture of what the Unreal environment is. So just run the simulation over and over and over again until I get something I want. And then I can keep that as well um, if I ever need to re-render, re you know, modify the camera, stuff like that. And so... Um, um, and really beyond that, it, you know, I just want to do more work on the planet. You'll notice that in the last couple of versions of this, the planet has looked flat. Um, and that's because I was trying to see if, um, they had made it so that the, um, 
tessellated nanite displacement. Uh, worked in the Path Tracer. Spoiler alert. Still doesn't, uh, which is unfortunate. Um, and so I'm going to go back to having a geometry, you know, pre-displaced geometry planet um, that lo just looks a little bit better. It doesn't have, like, you know, the polygon, you know, issue where like you could definitely tell like some areas were just there was enough uh, geometric detail there to hold the uh, the shapes um at this kind of proximity to the mesh and so uh, i just have to come up with a solution that looks good and then bring back in here um but uh that's gonna be it um i guess just for uh the sake of some people that just want to watch the shot i'll just hit uh playback And I'll probably release uh, the pellet corrected version as its uh, own file. But uh, thank you for anyone who watched, and I will uh, see you in the next one. Bye.